please welcome Shelley Pingree, Congresswoman. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk a little bit about food waste. So food waste, this topic is not just about the wonderful lunch we just had that Dan made us. In fact, there are a lot of staggering statistics. Up to 40% of all the food in the United States is wasted. That's 160 billion pounds a year, 20 pounds per person for everyone in the United States. Now at the same time, as we know, there are 50 million Americans who don't have access to enough nutritious, affordable food to properly feed their family. So if we reduce the amount of food waste by 15% and redirected it, we could feed half of the people who are currently in need. Food waste costs us a lot of money. It harms our environment. You know, I think it's too easy sometimes to think, well, I threw away the wilted lettuce in the garbage. It's going to rot in the landfill, right? No, it's in a plastic bag. It's just going to rot. In fact, organic waste in landfills is creating methane gas, which is one of our worst global warming pollutants. If food waste was a country, it would be the third largest contributor to greenhouse gas pollution in the world. So I'm a farmer, a restaurant owner, a mother, and I've always been conscious about wasted food. But honestly, it was last year when there was a panel, Jonathan Bloom, Doug Rao, Dana Gunders, and I really got thinking about this issue. So then watching Dan Barber do um, some of the most passionate and articulate thinking on this, I decided maybe I should move forward. So I've been talking to them and a lot of other organizations, and right here and right now, I'm going to announce that this fall I'm submitting a bill in Congress that for the first time aims at tackling the problem of wasted food in a very comprehensive way. So just a little aside, I feel I should say this. Um, Congress hasn't fared too well in the conversation today. I've been listening. <laughs> um, you might be a little skeptical about, oh, yeah, Congress, so what? Um, but I just want to say a little you know, bright note here. Even in a highly partisan environment, there are ways to get things done. I've been in Congress for seven years, and in 2011, I introduced something called the Local Farms, Food, and Jobs Act. That was a bill that had about 30 provisions to make local food more accessible. A lot of them were like the things that Jill talked about this morning, moving some of the money from the commodity crops into things that would give more support to fruit and vegetables and the things that we're all talking about today. Well, my bill didn't pass, but we used it as a rallying point and a way to have conversations like this, bringing people and groups from around the country to talk about this. And then we worked very hard to separate it into little provisions to get as many of them as we could in the Farm Bill. And when President Obama signed that in 2014, frankly, the majority of our 30 provisions made it into the Farm Bill. So we're going to do that again with what we're going to call our Wasted Food Bill. We'll work hard to get support from both sides of the aisle, work with all kinds of organizations and groups to come in and talk about it, and then we'll just look for those opportunities to add on a piece here, a piece there, an appropriations bill somewhere else, and get it all done. So we're still working on the exact details of the legislation, and I can guarantee you it takes a long time to get through the legal process of writing a bill. But I want to talk a little bit about the outline of the bill, and I hope that all of you who are part of this important discussion will send us your suggestions and ideas. We kind of have four sections talking about food waste. Consumer level, the farm, restaurant stores, and institutions like school. So I'm just going to give you somewhat of a brief outline. If you think about it, a lot of it is about education and awareness. I mean, many of us weren't paying attention to food waste. I wasn't thinking a lot about the implications of it until I was here last year. And more and more people are starting to learn about it. But that's a big part, is how do we have a little more education, more public education campaigns. I was thinking about it like recycling. Probably all of you go out of your way to find a recycling can to deposit your empty bottle, if you're drinking a bottle of water. Well, we should all feel that same guilt when we're throwing away food, and that same sense of it. And some of that is just knowing these statistics and the impact. So a few things that we can educate people about. One of them is cooking smarter, and Dan is really leading the way, and we're seeing a lot of that here at this conference. Buying smarter. Dana Gunders, who was here last year, wrote a wonderful new book on strategies for things like, you know, make sure you use your beet greens, and that sour milk isn't something you have to throw away. It's wonderful in baking. There are things to do with food. When you do have to throw food away, um, encouraging people to have compost, uh, you know, operations in their backyard. There's all kinds of devices you can buy. You can learn about how to do it. Or if you're not in a place where you can compost your food waste, 
a lot of places like the city of Portland um, that I represent, there are startup companies now that will give you a bucket. If you pay them $15 a month, they come by every week, they take it out, and they make compost with it. And sometimes you get to pick up some of that compost too. We're going to put in some a provision um, to encourage more municipal waste systems having compost, and you can advocate for those. But we're going to put something in so that the USDA Community Facilities Direct Loan Program would direct part of their $2.2 billion as a set aside for composting. Um, one of the tricky issues we want to tackle is those sell-by dates on food. Most people are kind of shocked to know that all those dates you see on so many things you buy, they're basically arbitrary. They're set by the manufacturers, kind of like what would be a good idea of when you should eat this, and you really don't need to throw most of those things away just because the date. It's not a real expiration date. We were using the example of honey. You know, somebody found honey that had been stored in the ground for a thousand years in some archaeological site. So we know it can last forever, but a jar of honey will have an expiration date on it, and you don't have to throw it away then. So we're thinking of ways to get around this. It's not easy, but maybe we'll make uh, a rule that you have to put manufactured suggested date on it as like a disclaimer, but I'm open to ideas on that. So on the farm, now I don't have enough time and you don't either, to hear me talk about all the things that need to change in agriculture, and we've discussed a lot of them. And some of the fundamental things that we need to change could have a huge impact on food waste. If we didn't have such a monoculture in agriculture, large commodity farms that just focus on one thing, and frankly, if we had more farms just like stone barns, um, which is very prevalent in New England and New York and, and one of the growing things that's happening in small farms today. But in a farm like this, you've got animals and you're raising vegetables. So you have spoiled fruits and vegetables, plant waste. Um, you just feed it to the pigs or you feed it to the chickens and you have this wonderful cycle. Now, just as a little personal point of privilege, um, this is my farm. And I just want you to know, these are my pigs, and they said, could you please have us eating lobster, not Brussels sprout stocks? So it's Maine. We call it lobster-fed bacon. But you know, <laughs> come by any time. Um, so I mean, that's a very important thing. Restaurant waste, we own the restaurant. In some states, you're not allowed to feed restaurant waste to animals, but those are the kinds of rules we're going to be looking into because it should be this continuous cycle of waste food goes back to the animals. They go back to the restaurant, it all works out. Um, we want to make it easier to, for fruits and vegetables, uh, to, for farms to sell fruits and vegetables that aren't cosmetically perfect. Uh, you saw that earlier today with some of those uh, funny looking apples. Well, they're delicious, but some of that has to do with USDA grading standards. We think they need to be reformed and they shouldn't be so based on aesthetics. We're proposing a 25% tax credit for farmers, up to $5,000 a year, for farmers who donate extra food to soup kitchens and food pantries. That's a pretty significant credit for a lot of farmers, and it could be a very strong incentive to pick up all that food that sometimes gets left behind in the field. Of course, all farmers should do more composting, and organic farmers certainly do. It's a critical part of organic farming, like crop rotation. Um, and sometimes uh, it's, un it's not understood that organic matter in the soil is a is a very important part of carbon sequester. Just increasing the organic matter by a little bit um, will sequester a lot of carbon in the air, which is an important part of um, what we've been talking about today, of making farming more green and friendly um, to the environment. We're proposing some rules in the um, conservation standards in the Farm Bill, so composting is recognized as a conservation measure. We've got all kinds of little details that we can get into um, to support some of the ways that farmers can deal more appropriately with their waste. Restaurants, stores, um, all should be doing the same thing. Often restaurants and retailers are hesitant to sell ugly produce that doesn't fit in with existing standards. So changing the standards would be one way to go about doing it. Um, not having them throw away so much expired food, letting people know it's still safe and healthy to eat. Um, we're also looking into an expansion of what's called the Good Samaritan Food Act. That's a provision that protects retailers from lawsuits when they donate food to organizations um, and give it away. And we think by expanding that a little bit, they can't use liability as one of the reasons not to do it. It also would encourage more entities like a group called the Daily Table, which is actually a store that sells um, expired or donated food, but does so at low cost so people can have that opportunity. 
Composting is even more critical for restaurants, and many of them participate in a program to get rid of their organic waste. And some states like Vermont are banning organic waste in landfills by 2020. That's something we could do at a federal level as well. Institutions come through many of the same things. They buy a lot of food, waste a lot of food, and certainly in school lunch programs, we could change some of the procurement rules. So they are purchasing more non-standard produce, doing some light processing um, to so the appearance doesn't get in the way. This is just an outline, and I didn't get into every possible section of law and code, but these are some of the things we're thinking about doing to make it comprehensive, to raise awareness, and to get everybody thinking about it. It's very exciting to bring this information back and announce it to all of you after I learned it, uh, after I thought about this from last year, and I really am grateful to be in a room full of people who are being so thoughtful about this, so I hope you will participate have a tiny little bit of faith in Congress that we can move forward on something like this. If you've got some ideas, tweet me at Shelly Pingery or at Shelly Pingery, they can probably put it up, um, and use that hashtag from this conference, um, hashtag NYTFFJT. Um, so I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be with so many wonderful, thoughtful people who care about this issue. I'm excited to be announcing a bill in your presence, and now you have to have a restored faith in Congress that we can get it done. So thank you very much.